How he made me whole. Not enough time to tell me how he set me free. He's been so good to me. So good, I just can't tell it all. So good, I just can't tell it all. So good, so good, I just can't tell it all. Not enough time to tell you. How he saved me so Not enough time to tell you How he made me whole Not enough time to tell you How he set me free He's been so good to me So good Tell it. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it all. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it all. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it. Just can't tell it all.
every praise, every praise, every praise, every praise. Glory, hallelujah. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Hallelujah. Every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship. Every praise. Every praise.
to uh, maybe hook it up with uh, Luke chapter 1 and the benediction that uh, Zacharias gave um, to his son, John the Baptist, the latter part of, I think, verses 6 to 7 to uh, or either, yeah, 6 to 7 to 79. But we want to begin in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, just that one verse. May we all stand together. And let us, even if you don't have a Bible, if there's one close in your area or vicinity, hopefully that person won't mind you. Oh, get up on the screen, okay? We still can stand. Amen. All right. Let us all begin by reading together. Wait a minute. Hold, hold it just one minute. I, that doesn't appear to be together. That appears to be scattered. Okay, is everybody ready? Okay, let us begin again. Now turn to the New Testament. Luke, first chapter verses 76 to 79. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 76 and stopping at the 79th verse. The chapter ends in verse 80, but we want to stop at the 79th verse because that will entail and has the kernel of our thought for this morning in it. Luke 1, 76 and I'm reading from the NIV. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun, or the King James said, day spring on high will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Amen. We may be seated. I want to go back to um, Genesis. And that verse, uh, if you're not aware of the, that verse is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And um, if you back up the beginning of the 49th chapter, this is Jacob. Jacob is on his deathbed, and uh, he's, um, he's pronouncing blessings on all of his sons. And uh, in that uh, 76 verse, he's, um, he's uh, talking to Judah, or his son Judah. And he talks about in terms of that the uh, seat of authority will not leave the throne of David going through Solomon, that the Messiah will be coming through the successive reign of Judah, the tribe of Judah. Now, if you come over to Luke chapter 1 and look at these, uh, this benediction that Zechariah is giving over his son John the Baptist, and you remember the incident where Zechariah was a priest in the temple, 
the angel came to him and told him that he was going, his wife was going to have a son. He didn't believe it, and he was uh, struck dumb. He couldn't speak until finally when after John was born, then the people came to him and asked him, what are you going to call him? And then God loosed his tongue and said we're going, his name will be John. Now, this benediction that he gives here, he was supposed to have given it in the temple before he was struck down. But he gave it after God loosed his mouth and after John the Baptist was born. And the benediction, in essence, is this. John is not the Messiah because you have to understand that Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth, who were the mother and father of John the Baptist, they came out of the tribe of Levite. And going back to the Old Testament, to Genesis 49 and 10, it tells us that the Messiah is coming from the tribe of Judah. So therefore, it could not have been John the Baptist, but his father, he pronounces this blessing upon him, saying that you're going to be what? The forerunner. You're going to be the trailblazer. You're going to prepare the hearts of people to receive the Messiah. And we know now that the Messiah, what, is Jesus Christ. Uh, the same thing that Matthew uh, details in chapter 2, verse 2, where the uh, three kings or the three uh, astronomers from Persia, we call them the three magi, the three wise men. And uh, they had come and they stopped in the palace of King Herod. And they asked King Herod, we have followed his star. Talking about the star of the Messiah. And the reason why we have come from such a far and a great distance is we want to worship the king of the Jews. And we know that by the gifts or the value of the gifts that they brought when the star finally settled, over where the child was there in the manger at Bethlehem, the gifts were of such that they were only given to royalty. And because they were given to this baby's mother and father, this indicated that this child was what? Of royal birth. Now, if you want to write this down, you can. But I want to give you some prophecies from the Old Testament as it relates to the coming of the Messiah. You'll find in Numbers 24, 17, it tells us that the Messiah will be coming from Israel and it will come out of the star of Jacob. And you know that God had promised Abraham way back a long time ago and his son Isaac and Jacob that Abraham's seed, his descendants, were going to be so numerous, they would be, it would, it would be like a, a blanket of sand covering a seashore. You won't be able to count it. There would be so many people, it would be like trying to count the stars in the sky. So he tells us in Numbers 24, 17, that the child is coming out of the nation of Israel. Secondly, in Isaiah 11, 1, and then to cooperate with that, Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 33, that the child of the Messiah would come through the family of David from the tribe of Judah. We just got through talking about that. Isaiah 11, 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 31 and 33, uh, 31 to 33. Number three, the child will be born in Bethlehem. Coming out of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Fourthly, the child will be born of a virgin. From Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. And you can, uh, you can connect that with Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 and 22. Fifthly, the child would come at the appointed 
time, at God's time, that Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 26. Sixthly, the child would be coming and the child would be coming by the announcement of John the Baptist, who we just talked about a few moments ago. Isaiah prophesies this out of chapter 40, verse 3, and connect that with Matthew 3, 3. And then finally, the Messiah would be God. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and cooperate that with the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 14. Now, you'll notice that from Genesis coming all the way over to Luke, you're talking about a span of over 600 and some years that the people had to wait. And even Zechariah in his benediction, he makes the statement, he says that when the Messiah comes, that he will, what, come for one purpose, for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. And then he uses metaphors like, he will be the day spring on high, from the King James Version. In other words, he will be like the sun rising on a dark day. He will be like fresh water in a stagnant pool, implying the fact that Israel and all of the world at that time, and you've got to understand that the world at that time was under the iron hand of Rome, such as during World War II, most of Europe was under the iron rule of, of uh, Hitler and the German Empire. And people were put in subjection. They were put in terms of slavery. And you had to do what Rome told you to do. So now here is Zacharias saying that his son, John the Baptist, that he is going to announce that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, all of this injustice, all of this evil, all of this madness, he is going to eradicate it, get rid of it, and that God's nation, Israel, will what? Will be elevated back to prominence the way she was before she was put under the heels of the oppressor. Now, is there, call, is there any correlation between then and now? Yes, yeah, definitely so. For our culture now, our society now, it's blanketed with what? Injustice, with midnight sins. You name it, it's here. The only way that you can name a sin that's not, on, that's not prevalent at this moment is something that you make up in your own mind. But beyond that, same-sex marriages, and I saw on the TV the other day that more and more states are beginning to what? Sanction that, to say it's all right, to pretty soon all across the United States is going to be sanctioned. Now, that creates a problem for some denominations. Amen? For me, it creates no problem. I don't have a problem. Because basically, Scripture says no. That is wrong. That is, that is immoral. But because our society says it's all right, or the Supreme Court rules that in terms of its law, it's okay. That doesn't mean that God has sanctioned this. And believe it or not, some people really don't, don't know this, or if they do know it, they don't care. Believe it or not, sooner or later, God has got to judge America. He's got to. I know you love America, 
And I know that there are many blessings that God has given all of us. But when you look at the overall picture, and let me say this and I'm moving on. Many things that existed over 100 years ago still exist now, but in a different form. Racism hadn't gone anywhere. It's still here, just wearing a different dress, a different mask. But on the inside, eternally, the hearts and the minds are the same. Hadn't changed. Sexuality hadn't changed, just wearing a different mask, a different costume, but it, it exists. And it has become entrenched in our society. In fact, you look at in terms of whenever commercials come on TV, how are most things sold? Well, it's a car, a washing machine, whether it's washing powder, candy bars, whatever it is that's sold, most of the time, how is it sold? With sex. Amen. A woman. Liquor is sold with what? Sex. We are, uh, our society has become sex drunk. Amen. And the values of God, the moral issues that God has set down in his word, don't mean much to most folk anymore. There was a time, and I'm going to move on because I'm going to go through this. Uh, how long? I'm going to go this quick so you can get your plane. Is that all right? All right, all right, good, good. Uh, there was a time when I was a boy coming up, and I know Pastor is always talking about when he was younger. Well, what I'm, I'm doing, I'm comparing the present with the past. Everybody does that. If you don't do it, there's something wrong with you upstairs. And the reason why you compare your present with your past to see in terms of what God has done, how he has worked in your life, and where you've come from, and what you're part of now. Have you grown in your faith? Have you gotten stronger in your belief? Are you closer to the Lord? Do you see signs and evidences of Christ returning in this millennium now? Do we see it within the halls of the holy sanctuaries or what we call churches, no matter what the denomination is? Is it just a shallow worship? Are we just going through, are we marking time? Are we just going through the motion? Or do we really love the Lord like we sing about, like we pray about? Now, Admittedly, God knows my heart and your heart. And he does not go by the exterior. He doesn't go by my actions. He goes by in terms of what's in my heart and what's on my mind. Because he knows inwardly propels itself eventually to the outside, and then you find out what I is on the inside. Amen? Now, We'll look at this aspect of worship, praise. The wise men said, we've come to what? To worship. Who? The king. Who is this king? King of the Jews, the Messiah, um, prophesied from the Old Testament. Zacharias talked about it. Mary, when she went to Elizabeth, when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, and we are told that when Mary knocked on the door and Elizabeth opened the door, John the Baptist, which was a fetus inside of her stomach, leaped for joy because he recognized what? The Messiah in Mary. If you go over to the, uh, uh, to the beginning of chapter 1 and you look at in terms of when Mary was approached by the angel and she was told that she would become what? The mother. She was chosen. Now, I want to dispel the myth that Mary was perfect. That she was the only virgin that lived at that time. No. There were many other virgins. Mary wasn't perfect. She had sin like all of us do. Because scripture says that what? When you're born in this world, you're born into sin. 
Even Mary herself says after she has been given the announcement that she will bear the Messiah, then she uses the statement that she is the handmaiden of her Savior. What does the word Savior mean? In actuality, it means to save one from their sins. Go back to Matthew chapter 1, I think it's verse 21, where it says that the angel told Mary and Joseph, you will call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people, what? From their sins. That was his purpose of coming. Now, this idea of when they worshiped, when they gave praise, when the baby leaped, when the wise men brought gifts, when the shepherds were so elated when they were told about it. Everybody that you read in the narrative of the Christmas drama was excited. Amen? And they were excited because nothing like this had ever happened. And they had been told years ago a Messiah is coming. But they waited year in, year out, millennium in, millennium out, no Messiah. And conditions got worse and worse and worse. Until finally, he bursts on the scene. And now they get the news. They are glad. Now, there are three things that I feel are inherent in that worship because we know when we were studying Psalm 103, what did we say Psalm 103 indicated? When David started out by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name, what did we say David was saying? Or was everybody asleep that Sunday morning? Well, I guess I can remember since the messages that were given to me, okay. So I'll make an allowance for that. Let's go back to Psalm 103. Briefly, let me give a condensed interpretation of it. We said that David in that psalm, it is chock full of God's mercy. From the beginning to the end, he talks about God in terms of what? Forgiving us for our sins separating our transgression from us as far as the east is from the west. He talks about being when God, when he loves you, and when he has his arms around you, the benefits that you get from being in Christ. And he talks about in terms of the five things he, he uh, reiterates in that. Then he talks about in terms of that everything that God has done, that he claims he's going to pass it on to what? Generation after generation children, grandchildren, great-great-grands, and etc. on down the line. Then he ends up by saying, let everything in God's created universe praise him. Praise ye what? The Lord. Angels and stars and moon, everything, animals, trees, grass, everything that, well, let's connect that with the other song, everything that have breath. If you're breathing, if you're alive, if you got any kind of, uh, 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 if, if, if there is living in you, life in you, praise what? The Lord. Why should we praise God? That's what I'm trying to get at, the root of this. Why? Let me, let, let, let me state and make the question a little different. Why would we go through all of, for some of us, not all of us, through the tedious ordeal of getting dressed this morning, trying to decide out of 200 uh, pieces of garments which one I want to wear, out of 800 pairs of shoes, which pair of shoes I'm going to wear, uh, and what type of makeup I'm going to put on men, what type of tie, shirt, blah, blah, blah. Why would we go through all of that just to come here for an hour or two then to go back home and disrobe? Have you ever thought about that? 
all of that energy, getting up early, eating breakfast, preparing yourself mentally and physically, and then when you get back home, you disrobe and you take off your, your Sunday duds, as they used to say in the country. Why? Is it the duds that make us holy? Is it, is it the purpose of coming here that makes us holy? <laughs> See, I'm asking questions and y'all ain't saying nothing. You just looking at me like knots on the log, like a like a frog on the log. Ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. Why am I here? Some folks say that I could spend this time much better. Don't have to dress up. I'm a fine does. Go to the mall. It's exciting. You can eat, watch folk, buy stuff. Why? Is it tradition? Because our parents used to bring us here. And during my day, I didn't want to come here, but they made me come here. And they said that I, be, I, I, I bet not even make any kind of peep or no, no gesture of being negative against it, because I know parents nowadays, we are living in a different society. Anyway, let me, let me move on. Um, am I here out of tradition, habit? Friends, family, the choir sings good. Young, the young men and women, they showed out this morning. Am I here because I want to hear them again? Last Sunday in the year. Oh, come on, y'all. Or am I here because, like the wise men, I want to see the king? Three things are involved in praise. First of all, praise comes from the inside out, not outside in. Let me say it another way. You can't fake real praise. Sure wish I had a praying crowd this morning. Maybe a funeral crowd would be better. You can't fake praise. It's either there or it ain't there. Now, if I come to a worship feeling crabby on the inside, I just had an argument, a feud with my wife, or somebody bumped my car on the way here and aggravated my spirit, it's going to be hard for me to see the king, won't it? <laughs> Which means that my mentality will have to be reprogrammed. True, real, genuine praise comes from the gut up. It doesn't splash on you like, what's, what's this thing about pouring a bucket of cold water, you know, and they were making so much money, whatever that thing is on YouTube, yeah, well, anyway. It has to be splashed from here, phew, coming out. Amen? Not only is real praise internal, but it is intense. I want to give an example, but I don't think that example will roll over too well this morning. Um, whenever you go to a wedding and the uh, bride and the groom stand at the altar, and after the uh, ceremony has been given and the, um, the uh, administrator says, I now pronounce you 
man and wife or husband and wife or whatever the case might be, whatever terminology they use. And then the administrator said, now you, now you may salute your bride. Hopefully not of the same sex, but anyway. I was hoping that would wake up some folk. Maybe, maybe it didn't, I don't know. But anyway, you may now salute your bride. And for most salutations, they are what? The kiss is what? Passionate. Now, every so often you'll be at a wedding where I call it, it'll just be a bop. Come on, come on, wives, you know what I'm talking about. And then there will be some weddings that it will be a passionate kiss. Amen? I mean, the, the groom, he will get down. And when he gets down, everybody, like you're doing there, ha, 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 just be laughing. Oh, look at him, child. Look at how he's kissing her. Passionate. Intense. And he's not trying to put on a show for those that are there. But he's doing it, hopefully prayerfully, because he loves that woman that he's going to spend the rest of his life with. When I praise God, it should be, it should be just like a tsunami that starts out and that gathers momentum and power and that erupts. Letting God know. Because you see, I can't pay him with nothing I got. I could have a thousand dollars in my pocket. Doesn't mean nothing to God when he owns all the gold, the silver. He owns the hills. He put the grass on the hills. He put the cows on, to eat the grass on the hills. So he don't need what I got because what I got, he gave it to me. Uh, trying to conjole him doesn't mean anything. You know, scratching his back trying to make him feel as though he's a great guy, you know, trying to build him up. You, I, I can't fool him that way because he knows who he is. I can't, I, 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 I can't find a way to manipulate or maybe even to use strong man tactics. That won't work with God. The only thing that will work with him that will satisfy my inner being is that I come to him in a sincere, humble spirit, realizing that he has given me what? One more day, <clears throat> one more worship moment, because there was a gentleman that we utilized, that, that, we, that we funeralized yesterday, is not here today for one more service. Do you understand where I'm coming from? And it wasn't because he was a sinner or one because he didn't do God's will because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us according, if you withdraw God's grace and mercy, this building, this room will be empty this morning. Totally empty. But the only thing that, that, that would be left here would be the keyboard, the organ, the drums, the speakers and the mics, table, furniture. But beyond that, no people. Why? Because God's mercy has given you and me one more chance. Internal praise, intense praise. But a third thing that I thought about, that praise has to be spontaneous. Spontaneous. You have you ever come into the presence of a person and even though that person maybe greeted you with a smile, but there was, how can I say it? There was something that went from your heart to their heart. There was a, uh, uh, well, you couldn't see it, but it was like a spirit that connected with their spirit and even though they were smiling 
and it was an acceptance in terms of their physical action, but yet you felt as though that they really didn't like you. Have you ever had that to happen? They didn't say it. They didn't act like it, but it came from in here. Whatever is in here, you cannot, well, maybe if you're a good actor or actress, maybe you can fake it uh, every so often, but sooner or later, fake praise catches up with you. And if it ain't real, then God will expose you. In this day and age that we're living in now, it's a lot of fake praise going on. What do I mean by fake praise? Entertainment. Illusions. Smoking mirrors. That kind of thing. But during the day of Jesus in Judah and in Israel, everything was so crude until there was no way to fake it. You either is or you won't. Let me conclude by going to the fourth chapter of John. And there was a woman that went to the well. I spoke about this yesterday. And you know the story. She came about 12 noon because she didn't want to face the other more uh, um, moral ladies of the community because they would look at her strange and they would talk about her. So she made certain that they had gotten their water and gone home so she would be by herself get in and get out of the way. Remember when Jesus came in, he told the disciples, he said, go in the village and get whatever victuals that we need and I'm going to stay here. Being God, he knew that woman was coming, didn't he? Didn't he know it? And he knew why she was coming. He knew that she thought she was coming for water, but he knew that she needed more than that H2O. She needed some other kind of water. That woman was messed up. And you remember the conversation that she had, and I don't, I don't have time to go through all uh, log it, but at the end of it, Jesus tells her, go and get your husband. And, uh, and, then he, and then it's like, well, he knew what he was talking about. Then he said, oh, wait a minute. Not, yeah, not, not this husband, because this makes number five. You had already four of them. So, you know, go and bring those other men. The indication was that she had really not been married to all these men. But anyway, whatever the case might have been. And after he told her about her past, it blew literally her mind. And John tells us she left her water pot. She came to get water, didn't she? But he revolutionized her thinking on the inside, and water was no longer a primary issue in her life, because she ran back. She didn't walk back. She didn't trot back. She ran back to the village, and she said, Come see a man that has told me everything about me. And then they responded by saying to her, Okay, we heard about this Messiah, but we want to go to see him for ourselves. A lot of people today need to see Jesus. I don't mean religion. I don't mean programs. The only thing that's going to change the face of this universe is seeing Jesus. And whether you accept this or not, it really doesn't matter because if you are spiritually uh, 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 cognizant, you can see the handwriting on the wall. You can see the signs. And I don't know when Christ is coming back, but it won't be as long as it has been, believe me. And when he comes back, he's not coming back like a baby this time, but he's coming back like John tells in Revelation 5.5, 5, he's coming back like a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's got to judge sin. 
He's already judged it on the cross where he gave his life. But he's got to judge sins. Satan is still the prince of this world. And when you go to Jesus' camp, you become a traitor to him. He gets angry. But he still, believe it or not, he still knows the weaknesses, the inherent weaknesses in all of us. And just because you're saved and I'm saved doesn't mean that we are above temptation. No, no. Satan knows what button to push in your life. He knows who to push. Well, let me say it this way. He knows what button to push in another person to push you to say or to do something that you normally wouldn't say or do. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, he knows. And the only thing that can keep you grounded is that you must stay in prayer, you must stay in his word, and you must constantly call on him. For he says, call on me anytime, morning, day, or night, and I'll answer you. And when Jesus came, when that baby was born in Bethlehem, not only you notice that, it said that the sky became scintillating, brilliant. It lit up, and it was just like the universe all of a sudden collapsed and came together, and the shepherds saw an angelic angels and hosts of angels singing and singing and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill to man. How can they sing peace and goodwill to man? Why? Because the peacemaker is coming. The goodwill man is coming. And he's coming not only to cleanse us and forgive us of our sins, but he's coming also, what? To bring us together. That's the purpose of his creation of an institution called the church. The church ain't just for gathering. You can be in a social group for a gathering. The church is not for a gathering. It's for fellowshipping. It's for strengthening. Praying for one another. Sharing the brokenness of our journeys with one another being open and transparent to one another, not pretending like we are super Christians and that we've been on top of it all of our lives. Because them folk out there, they know that we ain't real when we ain't real. And none of us was born saved. Nobody. You came out of your mother's womb saved. You're the biggest liar in, in God's universe. You were born a sinner. And really to tell the truth, none of us really wanted Jesus Christ when he started to what? Pricking us. When the Holy Spirit started to thumping us. Troubling our minds. Troubling our hearts. Because we loved sins. It was delicious being on the dance floor. You don't have to say nothing. Because some of you, I know where you've been. So that's okay. You don't have to say nothing. And that's the reason why when Christ died, his death was such a heinous death, such a cruel death. Because sin is cruel. Sin will kill you. God knows that. And the only thing that can save you from sin, can I use the terminology in all of the cartoons and on TV now, you have to have the superhero. And I'm not talking about Superman either. <laughs> he ain't got no S on the front. But he does have a big C. And he's called Christ, the Son of God. He's come to save the sins of the world. 
sins come out of sin. Sin is the root of the tree. Sins are the branches and the leaves of the tree. And what we are seeing are the leaves and the branches of the tree. You may not ever remember this Christmas. It might go down in your memory and maybe after many years hereafter it will become so fuzzy and faded until you possibly won't even remember where you were when this happened. But it's not important about the trees, the gifts, that's okay. Decorating the tree, decorating the home, the wreaths, that's okay. But the more important thing is, does Christmas mean to you Christ or commercialism? Does it mean one more time being with the family before God calls you home? What is the true meaning of Christmas in your life? We have come to worship the king, the king of the Jews. What is his name? You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The invitation.